G'day and welcome. My name is Donald Gregg. And uh, I'm giving a, a talk on kernel engineering in general. This talk is kind of strange. This may be the first and last time I give it. And that's because of this particular audience talking about kernel engineering in Australia. Uh, unlike technical talks, and I'll be giving a technical talk later today, uh, here we, I have a, a, a unique opportunity to talk about kernel engineering and what it's like to be an Aussie who, who enters that. Uh, there's, there's many other people and, and some of them in the audience who have done this. Uh, but myself, when I, when I grew up and worked in different roles, worked with lots of uh, IT professionals in Australia, kernel engineering was, a, was not a very well-known uh, industry. Um, and that's a pity because it's, it's very useful to know what they do. Um, as a customer, it's useful to know if you're considering it as a career. Uh, and that's what I thought this talk would be uh, most suited for. And this talk is, is particularly about uh, being an Aussie and, and doing kernel engineering. So uh, this will not become part of my repertoire. I won't be delivering this in, in, in Santa Clara or, or San Francisco. <coughs> this is the first and last time that I, I, I'll, I'll deliver this talk. First so, and last and always. First and last. Uh, kernel engineering, what do I now? So, um, as I just introduced, um, this talk will be about kernel engineering as an Aussie. Uh, but I also want to mention some other highly technical professions uh, because, again, uh, growing up in Australia, um, you don't get exposure to them. And it's useful to know that they exist, they're very important. Kernel engineering is, is, is often seen as the pinnacle of IT, at least when I was growing up and when I was interacting with lots of different customers. But in fact, there are lots of different interesting professions that are just as difficult. Um, and in Australia, since, since we don't have a huge engineering base like they do in the US, you often don't know that these roles exist. So I do want to mention a few other roles as well because um, it's really interesting to know about them. <coughs> Let's see, going to the US to work or working for Mars, and um, certainly what I wish I knew before I did this, um, it's always uh, you know, useful to learn from mistakes. Uh, and, and again, why this talk Australia is far away from much software engineering, especially in Solaris. Um, and, and understanding engineering in particular is useful for customers of software to learn how technologies really work, um, understand why they were designed, uh, and people considering it as a profession. Uh, for engineering, if, if you're, you're a customer, you're learning things frequently, if you understand why the engineer cooked something up, what problem they were solving, um, it can really help you better use that technology. And in Australia, you don't have many interactions with kernel engineers. So this is, as far as I know, the first kernel engineering conference um, in the US. There's many conferences where I've spoken at about engineering. Um, and as a customer growing up in the US, you, will, you can attend many of these conferences and hear directly from the engineers about the technologies they've created, why they've created them. And that's really useful and, and, and uh, valuable interactions between customers and engineers. And we don't have too much of that in Australia, which is why uh, I thought Kernel Conference Australia was a great idea. And uh, that was also an idea for a keynote. So who am I? Um, I'm author of some uh, very famous software such as LSSS, Board, Ged, Bottom. Uh, if you haven't seen these before, I'll give you a quick demo. So here's LSSS. Uh, what LSSS does, it's uh, LS minus L with star sign, so that you can see the star sign of each process. <laughs> <laughs> so those guys are Gemini's, this guy is Taurus, this one's a Libra, so yeah, that, 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 that might make, make a difference. Um, I'm surprised this works on Macintosh, I haven't run on Macintosh before. Uh, of course I've got a PSSS equivalent, uh, which means a good guess. <laughs> I can see what star sign process is like. Um, but seriously, there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, important and, and valuable stuff I'd like this I'm known for. I, it's, it's hard to pick a favorite, maybe board is. So uh, anyone who sees men LS or the screen refreshing so quickly, well, that's just not right, is it? Oh, there we go. Does that ring a bell? Oh? Does that ring a bell? 
<laughs> Some people don't want to confess that they're that, that, that old. 2,400? Uh, surely not. Oh, wait for it. <laughs> Does that ring a bell? Would you like to whistle it? <laughs> Fantastically useful software. Uh, I've got a whole website of this. I've got tools, um, and, and the role of the specials is to have no purpose whatsoever. Um, if they had a purpose, they wouldn't be on the, on the page. Uh, it includes bottom, which is the opposite of top. It shows you the bottom processes that are running. <laughs> <laughs> I think that has a use, though. It has a use? No, no. I can't, I can't possibly use it then. I, I must drop it. Uh, and get, which, which I don't think I've, I've run on Macintosh before, get is a, a graphical version of Ed. Um, <laughs> Ed is the old Unix line editor, and I <laughs> oh, oh, it, why isn't anyone written a GUI for Ed? I mean, it makes perfect sense. You can have themes, you can have sound effects. <laughs> so, uh, some of those sound effects are pretty good. Some of those sound effects are pretty good. I mean, it's been a while since I played. But yeah, yeah, lots and lots and lots of, and, and there's lots of very very bad programs on here. Um, Oh, of course, X Manager stack uh, gives you a uh, random, it's a bit too small to read, but it's just random blinking lights. Um, and, and there's a program called Onster, which some people say it's their favourite thing. <laughs> Thanks. I'm going with BIOS had an API call for that. Oh, oh yeah. fantastic. Computer is on. Yeah. Computer is on. So back to the presentation. I didn't de demonstrate dev not random, but I think you can guess what that does. <laughs> um, that's, it just gives you a stream of the number seven. Uh, and dev, <laughs> dev B null, which is dev the block. How do you know it's not random? Mm, that's a very, very deep, meaningful question. <laughs> and slash dev slash B null is the, uh, of course, it's the block device version of dev null. <laughs> Which again, it's just a surprise no one's written this before. I, I just don't understand. I'm better known for things like Staff Engineer at Fishworks, uh, I wrote the L2Arc for ZFS, Dtrace IP provider, a bunch of other IP uh, Dtrace providers that I need to get put back soon. Uh, Dtrace Toolkit, um, I, I'm maintaining a blog where I'm trying to memory dump what I've been learning about performance and storage, blogs at sun.com slash Brennan. And a YouTube video, which uh, we made in about uh, less than 30 minutes flat, about shouting at JBODs, which seems to be really popular. How many people have seen that video? So pretty much most people. There we go. So I've now started to meet customers who say, you're that shouting guy. <laughs> yes, I'm the shouting guy. Um, it was very interesting. I, I got emails from people who thought it was a hoax, emails from uh, disk drive vendors who said they knew about the problem for decades. So uh, right across, across the spectrum. And if you haven't seen it, like, just go to YouTube and look at shouting at JBODs. <laughs> so what this talk will be about, uh, kernel engineering, um, other professions to mention them, working from Australia, working in the US. Um, and because in particular, these are the sort of things that I, I wish I knew when I was embarking on this. Um, I, I joined Fishworks and Kernel Engineering in 2006. So if anyone invents a time machine, take this presentation and give it to me in 2006, and then I'll, I'll find out what I'm getting myself into. So a day in the life of a kernel engineer, life in inverted commas, it varies a lot. It can be 50% email, 60% testing and troubleshooting, really important, 10% uh, meetings and design, and as a small fraction, always ne never enough of actual code development. Um, yes, that's over 100%. Uh, that's, that's a day in the life of a kernel engineer. You do spend a lot of time, the point of this is you do spend a lot of time testing. So uh, things must be tested thoroughly and, and rigorously. It's, it's, uh, it's extremely important because uh, as, as a kernel engineer, you are creating the code yourself. There's no one else who has more expertise in that code. So quite often the buck stops with you. You need to be able to um, say that this has been thoroughly tested. You understand how it works. Kernel engineering culture, um, and, and it was a bit of a culture shock to go over there. And, and I, I'm, I was working with the Sun Microsystems uh, kernel engineers. Uh, and just as a very, very quick background, 
a group of them, which included um, the authors of D-Trace, like Brian Cantrell and Mike Shapiro and Adam Levintel, um, created their own skunk works at Sun uh, back in 2006 called Fishworks, where they were to create uh, appliances and uh, do, uh, do with Solaris what, what, what Sun had not done before, make it into a, an extremely compelling product for other markets, um, even for non-Solaris people, for Windows people as well and, and, and so on. Uh, and I joined that team and, and was thrown into the, the, the deep end of kernel engineering culture. And some of the things I learned, which is very interesting, screwing up, because you will eventually, uh, apologize, take responsibility, fix the problem, and don't argue. Sounds kind of obvious. It's binary in kernel engineering. That's the only, thing, that's the only acceptable approach. Uh, and how I learned this the hard way um, when I, uh, in one of my first putbacks, a putback in Solaris terminologies where you land a patch or, or integrate into the uh, source gate. One of my first putbacks, um, uh, one of my colleagues t tells me the next day, I broke the gate, I broke the source gate. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm sorry, what have I done? I've, you know, people are running my bits and they're, they're encountering this bug. And so I have a look and I didn't, actually break any, anything algorithmically or anything to do with the software, the nightly build of the gate had a lint error. And that was it. The software worked just fine. Um, lint, if you, if you don't know lint, lint is the C style checker. Um, and it was just complaining about, well, it, it's not the C style checker, but it's the, um, uh, it, it, it can help find uh, problems in, a, uh, in C. And, and it's, it, it, was never, it was never broken software, but uh, the, the, the point was, don't argue back with them. Uh, the, the correct response with that was, even though it was just lint, and even though it seemed like something not that important, uh, it was, had to be fixed. Uh, don't argue back with the, uh, the, the other kernel engineers. Uh, code review is another important uh, kernel engineering culture. When we put back into the, the kernel, we have another senior engineer review our code and tell us whether it's good or bad. Uh, if they reject it and say they're not happy with one thing or another, we can't put back. We can't put back until they're happy. We may be missing our deadline. Uh, we may be getting into lots of trouble, but we still can't put back. Uh, the gate is actually, I mean, in, in Solaris, the gate is actually protected, so you can't put back without them having clicked a form. So to actually put back, you'd have to uh, hack into the scripts, which is sabotage, and you'd probably get fired pretty quickly. Uh, but again, that's part of the culture, is you cannot uh, integrate code without the senior uh, engineers reviewing it. And that's something that would be great to see translated into other areas. So uh, uh, I, I, I'm trying to introduce this into documentation, uh, because in documentation, you, you can have technical writers go to publish something, um, as as a, an engineer, and in some cases an authority of engineer, I will say, you need to fix these things before it gets published, and they ignore me because they want to get it published really quickly. Um, that that would be alien in kernel engineering. So when a senior engineer says this is broken and you must fix it, there's, there's absolutely you cannot argue with it. You absolutely have to fix it before you can integrate, um, and and that works really well. Asking for help. Uh, and then listening and admitting you were wrong, because you will be wrong at some point, um, is another important part of the culture. Um, you'll be wrong, because kernel engineering is complicated. Um, you need to be able to, uh, and, 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 and frequently in kernel engineering, we'll have what seems to outsiders to be heated arguments. But we're fleshing through the technical points as quickly as possible. And it's not personal, even though we may, may actually shout at each other. Uh, we're, when we're, we're working with other kernel engineers, we're just trying to get to the bottom of things very quickly. Um, and, of course, you, you're, you've, you've been working on something for a few weeks, you've designed something, you're proud of it, another engineer comes along and drops a single technical point that invalidates it. You have to be able to say, okay, I, I've been wrong, um, and, and not be stubborn and, and, and protective of what you've just been working on. So that's another part of the culture. Being able to admit you were wrong very quickly, um, Get down to the technical facts. Don't take it personally, because you will be wrong. And perfection is another big part of the culture. 
excuse me while I walk over and grab a coffee. Uh, and I hope you can still hear me. With perfection, and uh, no offense to other operating systems, but um, with Sun and Solaris, uh, they, we like to think that the, the Solaris kernel is, is as close to perfect as, as possible. And, and I'm sure other kernel engineers have similar. Uh, well, we, we, we do have all these paid engineers working on it. Um, So with, with perfect, perfection is a very important thing for the Solaris kernel. And as a, uh, a software engineer, frequently when you're trying to solve a problem, you'll come up with a, a, an idea that looks good enough, but you can think of a better way. So I, I, I may think, I can solve this problem in three days. Eh, it'll be close enough. She'll be right. The proper solution, the elegant solution, ideally, would take three weeks. But you want this fixed quickly, so I'll just do the three-day approach. Uh, no. So with uh, that kernel engineering culture, you do the ideal approach. You just do it in three days. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was also another, another shock. I mean, you know, I had been an open source uh, developer before I joined the kernel engineering team. And I could write code very quickly. And I could write um, silly programs very quickly because I just got it close enough. Um, didn't have to be perfect. Uh, when I joined the kernel engineering group, it felt like I had slowed right down because all of the decisions I was making, the software decisions, now had to be the best possible. Um, and if I could think of a better way to do it, I just had to do it that better way. Coding. So with coding, uh, if it isn't tested, it doesn't work. Um, you may hear this often from other, other presentations, and it's something we, we completely believe in. Uh, with the Fishworks group, uh, we have a test suite with thousands of tests, and it's, it's accepted that when you put back features, you put back the tests with the features. So uh, that's another thing that, that um, something I learned the hard way, if, if I could go back in time and give myself this presentation, I would encourage myself to write better test suites as an open source developer, because test suites save you a lot of time in the long run and maintenance. Um, so I've written programs like Chaos Reader before, and, and uh, I had my own sort of shell scripts to test the thing. But uh, if I got to do that again, I would uh, do more research, research into, into the topic, because test suites and doing automated testing is a problem that, that is common. And if you do a bit of digging, there's a lot of software packages out there that will help you. Um, It'll take you a few days to learn the software, but once you do, it will save a lot of time in the long run. Um, but testing is a, is a big part of the culture. Style is law. Uh, everything must have the right style. Um, at Sun, for, for and, and I'm talking about coding style. At Sun, we have a tool called C-Style, which applies what I believe has been called uh, Bill Joy format. Uh, so we all look like we've written code exactly like Bill Joy. Uh, and it helps a lot it, when you read other engineers' code. Um, you, can, you can pick it up much, much, much more quickly. And it's another thing, I, if I could go back in time, uh, things I wish I knew. I wish I paid more attention to style when I was an uh, open source developer. Uh, when, because style is actually one of the easy, easiest things to get right. Uh, you can just use a tool that will, that will complain. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're doing C or Perl or Python. There's quite a number of tools out there to help out. Uh, Perl, you've got Damien Conway's best practices, and there's a tool that will apply that and do all the checks, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what, whatever language, there should be something out there that will help you out. And it, it's one of the easiest things to get right, and it, and, it, and it pays off a lot. When other engineers are looking at your code, and when I look at other code, if it's not styled, which is unusual for Sun, um, usually means they're not an engineer yet, uh, it really looks disgusting. Uh, we, we, we spend our lives just looking at the same identical style code. So if you are going to write code, do yourself a favor. It's, it doesn't take that, that long, but it really pays off to uh, adhere to a style um, for consistency. It will help other people read it. It will help you maintain it. Um, and, and maybe it's, it's part of the, the psychology. If you've been sloppy with style, maybe you've been sloppy with the algorithms. Uh, maybe that's not true, but uh, style is easy to get right. And with coding, of course, keep it simple. That's standard. 
Performance is another thing you work on a lot in, in kernel engineering. And a quote which uh, I believe has been attributed to Brian Wong is, if it wasn't benchmarked, it performs badly, which I guess is the companion of, if it isn't tested, it doesn't work. And with kernel engineering, there are so many subsystems, there's so many products we produce. There's really an endless list of things that we need to test to make sure they perform well. And there's always gaps. So um, as a kernel engineer, I'm often doing performance testing of code as well to try and find out if there are issues. There's lots we don't know. It's a, it's a very interesting field. Uh, and that's, that's another thing I wish I knew before I, before I started all of this. Uh, there is a lot we don't know. So file systems like ZFS, we do know a lot about the performance, but ZFS is also um, quite complicated. So uh, we'd like to know more. We'd like to write a D-Trace ZFS provider so that we can get more insight into um, uh, the timing of different ZIO stages more easily. Uh, but in any body of software, the more you learn about performance, the more, the more you can realize that there's, there's lots we don't know. There's always work to do. Finding perf problems is usually easy. Uh, I remember when I was a, a system administrator, uh, finding perform performance problems or finding kernel bugs was uh, considered difficult. Like uh, that would be someone who's an ex expert or senior sysadmin, maybe you're lucky and find a performance problem. In reality, finding them, finding them is easy because there's lots uh, if you have a good understanding of performance. It's finding the ones that matter that can be hard. So I can look at any subsystem and find performance problems quickly. Uh, which ones do we actually go and fix? So the question becomes, oh, of course, D-Trace helps you find the performance problems, which I'll talk about later today. Uh, and the question rapidly becomes, which performance problems are hurting us the most? And so D-Trace can help us quantify that. Uh, and of course, I've worked with, with, with other groups at Sun who, before they picked up D-Trace, they were off solving all these performance problems but they didn't actually matter. Uh, there, were, there were larger problems lurking that they hadn't identified and prioritized. So, and, and they thought they were doing a great job because I'm finding all these problems and fixing them. Uh, but the thing is, there's lots of problems. There's always gonna be lots of performance improvements you can make. Um, to be really good at this, you need to be able to prioritize. And of course, and it's been mentioned previous, previously this week, we like to look for the low hanging fruit and fix that first, well, and then dig deeper. That, that, I'll, that, that's, Andre said, if I dig deeper after getting the low-hanging fruit, I won't reach the top of the tree, or won't reach the fruit. So maybe I need a better metaphor there. Uh, weird, weird kernel uh, entertainment, something that I didn't know, and maybe I wish I didn't know. Um, Eno coffee, that's the era when you haven't had enough coffee, and, and at the moment I'm, I'm spouting Eno coffees. Eno beer, which I certainly didn't have last night. I had plenty of beer last night, except at 12 o'clock when Brisbane, things seemed to close, which is unusual. Uh, oh, I can tell. You get a bottle of wine at the Yes, yes. And as we found out, strangely enough, you can get a bottle of wine at the pancake place. So, as long as it's before midnight. As long as it's before midnight, as we showed our watch to the, uh, the staff. <laughs> Easter eggs, um, you'd be surprised that there, there are Easter eggs here and there. Um, maybe so much. Uh, Maybe not so much in the actual production code, but more in the um, other facilities that, that use the code, like test suites, although I don't want to give anyone hints to go looking. Uh, but uh, there is actually a lot of entertainment in, in kernel engineering. Um, I mentioned P5 bugs because that's a favorite as well. Um, there, are lots of, there are lots of things to improve um, in, in kernel software. I mean, you can look up the bug database on OpenSolaris and have a look. Um, and one of the uh, frequent jokes is if someone files a bug that you that really isn't important. Uh, we change it to the lowest priority, P5. And we always threaten to, I, I haven't done this myself, but um, the threat is that we write in the justification field, I would make it a P6, but priority doesn't go that low. <laughs> but anyway, there's lots of, lots of very nerdy uh, entertainment in uh, kernel engineering. Side effects from working in kernel engineering. Uh, I was preparing something, but when writing this slide, I got the following crash. How many people are flinching and reading it? Sorry, I made that up. 
This is actually, this is actually a, 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 a stack from, from Mac OS X, which I've replaced a kernel with a Unix. And I made that up because how many people flinched? Uh, how many people checked the stack to see if it was their code? <laughs> there, there you go, spot the kernel engineer. This is one of the side effects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's sinking in now. Yeah, I tricked you. I tricked you. I'm sorry. Uh, this is one of the side effects of working in kernel engineering is whenever there's a, a panic, um, Solaris panics, other operating systems may not, unfortunately. Um, whenever there's a crash and you see a stack trace, you flinch and you look at the code to see if it's yours uh, and scan up and down. Have I worked on VM map simplified? Did I work on M unmap? Well, I actually didn't work on any of these because this is actually from Mac OS X. Uh, but yeah, that, that's a side effect. And of course, you, you get a thrill when it's actually not your code. Hooray! <laughs> the kernel just panicked and it's not my code. Um, and you have to suppress this around customers because... <laughs> customers are usually unhappy. But yeah, it is, it is such a relief. Uh, Oh, and also, you weren't the one that reviewed, and I mean, you're looking for that as well. It's like, did I write this? Did I sign off on it? <laughs> I mean, but that's a good thing. It, it, it shows how seriously we take quality, and, and we would be terribly embarrassed if we made a mistake like that. Uh, other side effects, um, you can be possessive of your own code base. Uh, when you try to take a vacation or a holiday and people are putting back, then uh, you could, uh, it, it's, it, it's not five minutes, Andre, it's 20 minutes. Uh, okay. So other other side effects: uh, possessive of your own code base, um, uh, and you're trying to take vacation, and people are putting back into your code, and and you get a bit nervous. Um, but that's also good. You're proud of the, the the work you've done, and you want to make sure it doesn't get messed up. A haunting feeling of unfinished business um, in engineering and in kernel engineering. There's there's always so many things to do, um, so many things you'd like to do better. Uh, but you only have one lifetime to do it all. So uh, that's another side effect of, of working in this industry. Uh, these parts are not equally sized. Other professions. So uh, I used to do uh, instructing uh, around Australia and I'd, I'd meet a lot of people and, and in terms of career paths, some people would say I've become a senior system administrator, I've reached as far as I can go, the next thing is kernel engineering. And this may be reflective of uh, Australia's isolation from some of the large engineering departments um, in the US and in other parts of the world. Because there are other, if, you've, if you're bored of doing your job and you're doing system administration, which is a fine job, but you're bored of that and you want something that's more challenging, uh, it doesn't have to be kernel engineering. Um, and you don't do kernel engineering just because it sounds hard. You do it because you want, want to write code and the, the, you want to spend, or you, you accept spending 60% of your time testing it and 20% and of the time writing it, um, and you enjoy it. And you enjoy writing code that's going to be shipped to customers and run in production. So other professions to consider are performance engineers. There are a lot of performance engineers at different companies. Um, interesting role, as I mentioned earlier, uh, these people work with the kernel code or user land code and try and identify problems. Uh, and the code is always changing, so it's always a moving target. There's always, there's always new things to look at. Um, and it can be very interesting because you're understanding how software works, you're understanding how hardware works, um, CPUs, bus architectures. Uh, it's a, you, with kernel engineering, you can actually get isolated into just one department, um, especially if you join a big company as a junior kernel engineer, you may be just assigned one network device driver or one area to work on. But with performance engineering, it's, it's, um, you can have a broader scope, which can be very interesting. Uh, benchmark engineers. Uh, it's uh, creating quality benchmarks of products is, is something that's tough. And it's often not understood how difficult it is to, and, and I've blogged about this lots on my blog, um, it's tough to get uh, trustworthy answers. And we, we like to have really good engineers doing this because when you're running benchmarks, you're going to need to be checking things and running VMstat and, and IOStat and DTrace and making sure things work. Test engineers, um, as part of my role at Fishworks, I work with a lot of test engineers. And um, they really are the unsung heroes. They will, they're, they're, they're 
highly skilled technical people, but they um, try to try to do the the uh, the sort of rollouts that customers will do, this, this, uh, and, and go through all sorts of different configurations customers will do, and they run into bugs all the time because they're working on the most development alphabets, and um, they have the ability to go and, and pick through the source code and, and, and try and help us fix them as well. So it's a, it's a tough role, it's an unsung role, um, but it's one that, that, that uh, at Sun we're very, very dependent on. The, having good test engineers and, and, and trying to keep them in, in that role. Um, and it's unfortunate when we have really good test engineers and they go and leave to be, become kernel engineers. Uh, if, if you're really good at te test engineering and you like it, stay doing test engineering because uh, we need them. Um, technical writers as well. Um, I like to, to, to have documentation written by the, the experts, so if you are very technical, it can be an excellent profession. Working from Australia. So, some positives if you're working um, kernel engineering in Australia. Communication is easy these days. Uh, email, IRC, AIM. Uh, we've got, in the Fishworks engineering team, we have uh, Greg Price, who, who commonly works from, from Melbourne, Australia, and he got a webcam in the, the Fishworks office in San Francisco so that he can see the, the, the the people at work to give a sense of presence. In fact, I have it, and I hope nothing rude is happening. <laughs> no one's there. Where have they all gone? <laughs> so, so there should be people sitting here, but they've all walked out. So if I if I pan it around, they may, they may be having a meeting. Working hard, but but you can you can understand that. Um, if you're remote, you're working from Australia, you can um, give you, gives you a sense of presence. You can, uh, yeah, I don't see where they all are. I just see empty chairs. But yeah, that's cool. It gives you a sense of presence. And I'm surprised. I've, nev I've never gone to the webcam at this sort of time. They're all watching on YouTube. No, 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 no. We, we're usually still there on Friday afternoon. Believe me, we're usually still there late on Friday afternoon. Uh, maybe it's good there's no one there. Nothing uh, um, embarrassing happened. Uh, we, um, me and Brian Cantrell are usually, well not usually, but often there until the final BART, which is the Bay Area Rapid Transit, um, which comes at 12.24 a.m. Uh, so that's our, and then the train stopped for six hours, so we have to go home. Uh, webcams give a sense of presence, that's great. Uh, there's another positive I didn't list. Sometimes it's nice to work in the Australian, I'm speaking from my own experience, working on the Australian time zone, you're not frequently interrupted with email from the US um, because the time zones don't collide. And so you get peace and quiet for several hours and then you go to sleep and wake up and you have 50 new emails to go through. So that can be a benefit as well. Uh, negatives. Uh, working from Australia in, in kernel engineering, you miss out on many of the conferences Except for Kernel Conference Australia, thank goodness. Yay. Yay. Hey, you're always dialing into meetings, but maybe that's not a negative. Um, <laughs> but maybe the best, the best point I've got here, and um, in Fishworks, when we, 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 it's a very small group, but when we hire, we try to get people based in San Francisco, and it's for the human interactions. Um, having constructive arguments is more difficult and slower over email. Um, it can still work, but uh, there's, there's so many things to debate and, and to flesh out with your, your colleagues that it can be very fast to do that in person. And, and in fact, certainly in our office, there's no cubicles. Um, it's just desks. So we can just spin our desks around and argue about something and, and figure out something and... Uh, it gets a bit noisy, so we wear headphones from time to time, but um, it works. And, and so, of course, it's a, it's a very interactive environment. But yeah, that's actually the reason why, um, um, from talking to different people at Sun who are, who are hiring uh, kernel engineers, that's why they actually want the, the bodies in the US, is um, it's, it's those interactions. It's, uh, seeing them and, 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 and resolving things very quickly. But it can work from Australia, and we do have, I mean, Sun does have 
um, Greg Price and James McPherson in Australia who are doing kernel engineering. And Gavin Maltby. And Gavin Maltby, sorry, Gavin, who's, who's moved to Australia, so. Uh, so it can work. And of course it's getting better because communication's getting better. Uh, working from the US, and this is definitely things that, that, that I didn't know at the time and, and thought would be interesting to discuss. So I wish I saw this presentation three years ago. Uh, this is from personal experience, so I'm not authoritative for this material. Um, there are plenty of websites on the US government uh, page that you can look up. First up, it's recommended to use immigration lawyers. So large companies like Sun have a lot of lawyers. Um, they have people who specialize in immigration and understand all the forms and procedures. They may not work for that company, they may be outsourced, but um, they've got access to them. So when I uh, went to the US to work, I was working with a, a team of immigration lawyers and they handled all my paperwork, which was great, because I didn't understand this stuff. Um, there are different types of US work visas. Um, and of course, here, here's my opinion, is these, these aren't official, and, and it's easy to look up the information online. E3 visa, which is what, I, uh, what I'm currently on in, in the US, uh, the E3 visa allows you to go to the US to work uh, for two years, but you can renew it indefinitely, which is a positive. Your spouse can work. Your spouse gets an E3D dependent visa. And the, the best good thing about it is it's Aussie only. So the E3 visa was created for, or created in relation to the Australia-US Free Trade Agreement, and about the same time as the Coalition of the Willing. <laughs> so we sometimes joke that I'm on the Coalition of the Willing visa. Uh, but anyway, it, it, it's a good thing that came out of that period of time. Um, since it's Australian only, because with these visas, they only issue a certain number of them each year, uh, you're not competing against the rest of the world for these visas. So it's much, much easier to get an E3 visa than it is a H1B or a green card or anything like that. So E3, great. What's bad about it, you can't change jobs. Um, I believe they have my job description actually punched into the visa database somewhere. So I'm there working on that specific job for this specific company. If that changes, I go back to Australia. Uh, and if it does change, like I lose my job, you must leave the country within 10 days. So does that mean you can't move between teams within Australia in the same office? Uh, I would have to be doing the same role. I'd have to like, have the you biggest... You have the paperwork, so you still do it yourself. So you'd have to be a permanent engineer still with that team level specialism. Exactly, because the E3 visa, I mean, as, as far as I understand, it's been approved because you've, you've, you've said my specialties are I'm doing... Um, I'm doing these things, I'm using D-Trace and MDB, I'm doing kernel analysis, performance analysis. I'd have to be doing that same skill set because that's the skill set they've approved you to go to the US and do. Um, so I guess maybe you could uh, um, talk to the immigration lawyers. You may, may be able to slightly change jobs, but it's, uh, it's, that's not the intent. The intent is you go over and do a temporary job. Once it's done, you go back. Um, H-1B is a, a different visa type. Um, something good about it, you can renew it up to six years, which is pretty good. I, it's not as good as the E3, which can be renewed indefinitely. Uh, one thing is about the H1B is it may be possible to change jobs uh, by getting the H1B re-sponsored by a different company. So um, that's a freedom you don't really have with the E3. Um, what's bad about it, the spouse can't, your spouse can't work, uh, and there is a limited number of H1Bs issued each year and they often run out of them on the first day of, of, of release. So, uh, and if you, if you do some research into this, the, the US, there's various uh, bills they're trying to pass through Congress to try and resolve it in a number of different ways. So one way is to increase the quota count, okay? Another way is to, the H1B currently works as a lottery, so you apply for it and maybe you get it, maybe you don't. I, I don't remember specifically, but I think the chances last time was 30% based on the predicted number of applicants and, and, and how many they had available, uh, which is not too bad. But another way that the, the, another bill that's thinking of fixing the H1B is, and this, this sounds kind of interesting, instead of a lottery, um, they order it based on, it, it, I'm re if I'm remembering this correctly, they order it based on your salary. So the most expensive jobs go first. 
And I believe the justification for this was uh, the, the H1Bs are also used by the health industry. And in, in regional places in the US, they're trying to hire specialist doctors. And they're getting bumped because companies are just hiring cheap help desk staff on H1B. And if the H1B is, is truly intended to bring in expertise into the country, it's hiring cheap help desk staff on H1B is just a loophole. And, and ordering it by salary means you're getting the expertise because, you, because expertise usually gets paid more. So that hasn't been passed, but that's one of the, the bills that, that the US uh, government is thinking about. Uh, it, and of course, it would make it easier if you were going to the US for a specialty role because um, you're likely to get paid a lot. If you're just going to the US to have a cheap help desk role, it's going to make it more hard. Uh, green cards, good. You can work anywhere. Bad, much, much harder to get. And I'm Thank you, that's a good point. So it was, uh, one of the problems with the green card is if you leave the States for more than six months, they can, they can or they will revoke it. They will revoke it because the, the intent of... Ah, yes. So if you leave the, the, the US for six months, the green card will be canceled um, because the green card, the intent is you're a resident. So if you leave for six months, you've just shown a different intent. Um, and, and you don't want to have a, a visa cancelled ever because whenever you do paperwork with the US, it's one of the key questions. And on the topic of paperwork, you need to fill out a lot of forms. DS-156, DS-157, although they're trying to make those things easier, LCAs, etc., etc. Um, they're going to ask a lot of questions. Gather this information beforehand for quick reference. Uh, this is what immigration law firms do in a giant, giant database. So they basically ask every question uh, that you could ever be asked on a form, compile it into a database, and when they need a DS-156 form, they just yank the data out and, and, and hit print. When they need a DS-157 form, they just yank the data out and hit print because they know everything about you. How much? Your name, your date of birth, place of birth, nationality. All right, that's fine. Your passport number, your tax file number, social security if you've got it, driver's license. Eh, that's not too bad. Full names uh, of all your family, maiden names, all their, dates, their dates of birth. All right, like, I think I can remember that. Every academic result you've ever had, the title, the date started, the date ended, the address of the institution, the phone number of the institution. Um, I usually check my c CV and then go to the website to get the phone numbers. And also, um, it's important because quite a lot of these are, are visas, having a bachelor degree or higher is a requirement. So it's, it's one of the few times that that bit of paper actually helps a lot, is when you're applying for these visas. Your entire employment history, job title, date started, date ended, address of employment, supervisor name, phone number, uh, maybe not too bad, you can check your CV. Current and past professional associations, um, uh, I, was, I was at the US consulate a, a few days ago, and, and this is a new one, um, but the names of them all. So I was listing IEOST, SAGEU, ORG, SOSAG. Again, check your CV. Entire military service history, country, rank, specialty, date started, date ended, if you've got it. Every country visited during the last 10 years, the country name and the year. And th this one's starting to get a bit hard. I had to go through my passport. It's like, when did I go to New Zealand last? And when did I go to China last? And yes, yes, that's right. They don't stamp it, so I had to go through my email and check itineraries. Every visit to the U.S. ever, the date you arrived, the length of your stay. Again, now this one required much more research. It's like I, I can't even remember how many times I've been to the U.S., let alone the dates I arrived. Uh, so digging through old emails, looking for old boarding passes, and a tip: keep your boarding passes. Um, if things go wrong in some of these processes, they can actually ask to see boarding passes to prove that you entered or left the country on certain dates. So, that, I mean, I know, they should know this stuff. It's like, you want me to send you the boarding pass? You should know this stuff. But anyway, there's, there's a tip. Keep your boarding passes. Every place of residence ever. 
the address, the date you moved in, and the date you moved out. I, I've lived in eight places. I can't remember where I've lived. I can't remember the day, I can't even remember the years I moved in and moved out. That one was really hard. Uh, so yeah, gather this information beforehand because beforehand, they will ask. Um, and to answer this, like I was going through photos, emails, like old bills, everything I could, I could lay my hands on. Um, and like, why are they asking for this anyway? It's like, yes, uh, six years ago I lived in Iraq next to a terror, terrorist camp. <laughs> it's like, you got me. Uh. Uh, no, for the video, that didn't actually happen, that's right. Uh, and then random questions. Do you seek to enter the U US to engage in export control violations, subversive or terrorist activities, or any other unlawful purpose? Yes, no, no, I mean no. Uh, are you a member or representative of a terrorist organization as currently designated by the US Secretary of State? I don't know, give me a list. Oh yes, they're very serious about this. They're not, they're not messing around. Um, what I'd love to know is how many people have actually answered yes to this? How, how many people has this actually worked with? And, and the last section is about some uh, essentials about living in the US, which I'll go through quickly. Um, it, it does help to uh, speak the language so people understand you better. So I have learned how to say Z, not Z. Cash, not cash. Um, What's that? Cache. cache is the, uh, the the CPU cache, the level one cache, level two cache, e cache. Oh, okay. The language difference. So in the U.S., if you say cache, they think you're talking about the corn shell. So um, you talk about cache, 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 and it's like, like you're talking about what Roland Mains is doing, or like. I, uh, I worked on the ZFS cache with the ZFS engineering team. That was the first big project I worked on, so the first thing I had to do was learn how to say ZFS cache, which is very difficult. I haven't said ZFS cache in a long time. Food, no meat pies, no sausage rolls, no kebabs, no VB, no Forex. So something to know. You found VB. No, not in the US, I found two is new. No, well, I'll get to that. The worst thing is high fructose corn syrup instead of cane sugar. Um, few soft drinks are made with real sugar. Um, and lollies, or, or as they say, candy is also made with corn syrup. It tastes different. Um, I, I really enjoyed coming back to Australia and drinking real soft drink. First real Coke I've had in a long time. Uh, you can survive BevMo sells Bundaberg ginger beer, thank goodness, two is new. Um, and there are several Aussie shops that sell things like Tim Tams and Vegemite. Although, um, uh, can't get in Canada, all right. TV, no cricket, no rugby, no AFL, thank God. No SBS World News, uh, or much World News at all, because you're in the US. And, and for cricket, I've been watching Willow. I'm not advertising Willow.tv, but no, that's how I use it. A few years ago, I paid $250 US just to watch the Ashes. Uh, this time, I, I, know, I know, I know, come on. This, this time it was cheap. It was only, I think, $89 US to watch the Ashes. No, no, they block all that stuff. So, so like, if you go to ABC Grandstand or BBC Radio or whatever, it's blocked. So you can have Yeah. You, you, you do the legal things. <laughs> Thank you, video camera. Uh, cost of living. Cheaper food, internet, domestic airfares, like, like the price from uh, LA to New York is not like the price from Sydney to Perth. More expensive car health insurance, phone plans for some weird reason. I mean, you have a highly dense population. You'd think it'd be cheaper. And uh, traffic violations. <laughs> What's that? Ah. No pun intended, I'm sorry. And I'm on time, I'm on time. This is, this, uh, it, it's fantastic, I I'm, I'm usually go hugely over time. But thank you, I, I, I did look forward to this. It's 
Um, the first and maybe last time I'll talk about kernel engineering and also going to the US to work. Um, it's, it's sort of inf information you don't, you don't find and I hope it's been useful to hear. Thank <laughs> you.